Hey, Mike. Hey, Karen. Good to see you again, friend. It's good to see you too. So do you remember the cooking class that we did for the geo for good Summit this past October? Uh, we got some great feedback from that class. And since I learned a lot from that class, I thought it would be fun to try it again. What do you think? I'm totally on board. Love the class. Let's, awesome. uh, let's do it. What do you have in mind? So lately I've been digging into Landsat 8 images, exploring all the different bands or trying to explore all the different bands and the band ratios, things like that. And sometimes I get stuck and I just wanted a professional, that's you, that's you, Mike, to help just clear things up. And well, okay, you know how when you know, you're know you cutting fruit um, and some fruit is easier to cut than others and cut, you know, you cut and slice different fruits to, to make it edible. Like the kiwi, for example, I used to hack at it to get all the furry skin off. And every time I made this big old mess. And then I watched a, a YouTube video where a professional chef showed me three different ways to cut a kiwi with little mess and wasting none of the fruit. And now my life is complete. I, I am familiar with uh, some fruit slicing and dicing. I, I think that's a good idea. Uh, we can explore maybe Landsat scenes and figure out how to cut and combine and uh, get a different smorgasbord out of a, a particular Landsat scene. Extract some different flavors with different band combinations. Um, really just play around with Landsat and explore the data. Um, does that sound like what you're interested in? Yes, perfect, thank you. Okay, so why don't we introduce ourselves and then we'll get started, does that sound good? So um, hi everybody, I'm Karen Tuxen Bettman and I'm a program manager on the Earth Outreach team here at Google. And while I have GIS and remote sensing background in me, I'm not really a coder. So I consider myself a code modifier. So I really rely on sample code and tutorials just like this one. Over to you, Mike. Hi, I'm Michael DeWitt. I'm a software engineer on the Google Earth Engine team. Uh, I've helped build Earth Engine and I've worked on the team for a while. Uh, I've created a couple of different scientific products uh, from Earth Engine, and I am not an expert in the remote sensing. So uh, happy to work with you, Karen, and, and figure out how we can slice and dice things. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so today we'll we'll walk through uh, just exploring Landsat data in Earth Engine, uh, figuring out how to take different subsections of it, um, get different, uh, different visualizations and uh, utility out of the, the Landsat scenes. Uh, so we'll, we'll get you a nice Kiwi example here cooked up. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, okay, okay, great. So specifically, we're gonna cover how to find Landsat imagery in the Earth Engine data catalog. This is kind of like where you would find your ingredients um, for this recipe. Uh, then we're gonna start examining, um, deep diving a little bit into the Landsat 8 bands. This is kind of figuring out how to pull the different characteristics, the different flavors out of the, the, the Landsat image. Um, we'll experiment with a di couple of different bands, a couple of different band combinations, um, even create a new band ratio and calculation, which is kind of like trying different things that can lead to some new bold flavors. Um, and then um, at the very end, we'll, uh, I'm gonna work on building an explorer to make it even easier to explore Landsat 8 images. This is kind of like the recipe, so you can experiment again easily in the future. So all you need is an Earth Engine code editor, um, and data from the catalog. Uh, Mike, why don't you go ahead and get them started? Sounds good. So here I, uh, I have my favorite search engine and I just search for Earth Engine Landsat. Uh, this will bring us to the Earth Engine data catalog. Uh, so the first result here is just talking about Landsat collections in Earth Engine. Um, for those of you who don't know, Landsat has many different missions, um, the most recent being Landsat 8. So uh, we have those all highlighted here with, with pretty thumbnails and descriptions. Um, I'll click on Landsat 8, and here it presents uh, just information about the, the satellite mission itself, and then some different collections. So these collections are like different um, products that are created from the raw imagery. So we have everything over here on the right um, from raw images, uh, top of atmosphere, which is just imagery collected at the, the top of the atmosphere, um, and then surface reflectance, where there's been processing done to try to remove the atmosphere and just get the data kind of as it would appear on the, on the surface. Um, surface reflectance is the one I'm most interested in today uh, because they, they tend to look nice because you don't have the atmospheric effects. Um, so just 
walking through this particular uh, page, we see things like data set availability, who the provider is. Um, this is a reference to how to access the data in Earth Engine. And this string encodes that this is Landsat. It's Landsat 8. Um, it's a collection 1, which I'll, I'll dig a little into later. Um, and then here we have the reference for the service reflectance data set. So uh, the description starts with just uh, overall summary of, of the data set. Um, I'm not going to read this all out to you. There's a lot of information here. Um, but we do have information about each of the bands and image properties. So these are properties that are available on each of the images. An image collection in Earth Engine is just a series of images that uh, have some common metadata. Um, so th these are with a common root and have uh, uh, all of these different provider uh, uh, features available. So things like sensing time, solar azimuth. Again, we won't dig into these today. I'm just letting you know that we do have them all available from the provider. Uh, also, uh, on, the, on this page, we have a code snippet about how to use this particular data set in Earth Engine. Um, you can just click this blue Open in Code Editor button. And here's one I prepared earlier. Um, and this opens up the uh, uh, code that we saw on the other page. This is just loading the collection mapping, uh, uh, cloud masking function over it, and uh, providing some visualization parameters using those bands that we, we saw earlier. Um, I can run this. So uh, when I run it, it actually executes the code, and I'm free to, to tweak any of these parameters. Um, here, we can see that it's visualizing three different bands. Uh, this is band four, band three, and band two. We can refer to the bands uh, uh, listing on this uh, data set page, and we can find out more about what each of these corresponds to. Got it. So I noticed the name in the left-hand column there the, where it lists like B1, B2, B3. Um, we need to remember those for later, right? Because that's those are the different kind of codes or like that's the name where we're going to specify the bands that we want to visualize or that we want to process in the Earth Engine code editor. Is that right? Exactly, yeah. Um, and so you can see here, uh, I maybe glossed over bands too quickly. Uh, when satellites capture images, they do so across a variety of wavelengths. Um, so these, these bands um, in this particular collection correspond to different subsections of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so we, we leave comments here talking about the, the particular wavelengths that are captured for, for each of these bands. Um, that is not necessarily true for all of the bands. Some of the bands are metadata or quality information. Um, but in Landsat, generally, we can talk about the color or the, the part of the spectrum that each band is associated with. So for this particular example, um, we're using a band combination of four, th four three, and two, um, which corresponds to natural color. Uh, you can learn about these different combinations of bands uh, from the USGS website. Uh, so they dig into, and we, we link to this from the data set page, um, they link provide much more information, both specifically about the, the individual bands themselves and also useful combinations. Uh, so this is sort of a, a cheat code. These are great recipes um, for accessing more uh, uh, information out of, out of the bands themselves. So what, what happens if you were to just put one band in that, um, that band combination? Instead of B3, instead of B4, B3, B2, what if you just say, for example, put B1? Yeah, great question. Um, so we can do that in Earth Engine, and it's pretty trivial just to uh, combine. So uh, select off a different band for visualization. So um, here, this is this is the most interesting part of the script. Uh, we're loading the collection. We're filtering to a particular time. We're applying this masking function, which is defined up here. I won't go into all the details there. Um, and then we're visualizing it. So we have this visualization parameters block where we describe the bands. Uh, we set the center, uh, which just says where on the Earth uh, we're looking. And then we add the layer uh, compositing with this, this median composite. So if I just use B1, uh, B1 is the uh, coastal aerosol band. It, it corresponds to like blue and ultraviolet wavelength. And it really um, picks up atmospheric uh, 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 particles and shallow water. Uh, so those are, those are highlighted. In the, in the visualization here. If we just have the one band, it shows only in black and white. 
um, because it's just a single uh, uh, value from here, zero to 3,000. That's so interesting. So what if you change it to B5? I mean, yeah. B5, I know B5 is the near infrared band or NIR, um, which is really useful in remote sensing for um, sensing plants and vegetation because green plants highly reflect it. So if, if people are doing eco ecological studies or forests and, you know, land cover detection, understanding where the vegetation is, is really important. What about that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll pull up B5 here. Well, that was and, easy. Okay, great. Yeah, all, all of this computation is happening on the underlying collection. Um, so all the all the commands that we're we're doing here um, are being sent to Earth Engine. The processing is happening on the Earth Engine server, and we're getting back the results. And as I pan and zoom around, um, you'll see that we're just fetching new imagery. So we have the entire Landsat collection that we're that we're operating on here. And there are ratios and or indexes that um, you can compute, such as NDVI, which is a vegetation index. Um, can you? It really helps to make the vegetation pop out. Can you show me how to do that later, a little later? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, we'll we'll talk a bit about different indices that you can compute, um, different computations over these bands, um, because just the just the band combinations themselves, or just exploring the bands, um, doesn't get to all of the the awesome, you know, sweet tasting juice that uh, <laughs> these, these data uh, can provide. Awesome. Uh, there are a couple more interesting bands um, just to highlight. Uh, band six and band seven are shortwave infrared. Um, so these are uh, particularly, uh, is particularly sensitive to water. Um, so you'll see atmospheric water and surface water um, absorb these wavelengths uh, pretty significantly. So they appear very dark in, uh, in the resulting imagery. This can also be used for identifying things like um, uh, wetness on the surface. So distinguishing between, for example, wet rock and dry rock. Um, I can show off a couple more examples. Do you have a, a favorite combination of bands that you'd like to see, Karen? Well, first, I wanted to look and see what the band 10 or 11 looks like, because mm. band 10 and 11, they sense the thermal infrared or heat. And uh, so and it measures like not temperature in the air, necessarily, but temperature on the ground, um, which is really, I think, interesting, especially when we think about urban heat island, or we think about, you know, comparing between wet and dry soil, like fire burn scars tend to be really hot. So, you know, compared to the nearby area, even like grasslands. So, um, it, yeah, I was wondering if we could look at that a little bit. That's um, really, I think, a useful band. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I have band 10 visualized here, and it's it's pretty bright. Um, I may have to change the visualization parameters here. Okay. So instead of going from zero to 3,000, uh, maybe I can go from zero to 8,000. Um, these are all, again, things that you can uh, play with in Earth Engine. I see 8,000 is too high. It makes it gray. Um, let's try four. And so we can, we can play with these visualizations here. Um, I do also want to just point at the tools that we have for exploring, in particular, um, the different band combinations. Uh, so here, I can say, look at B10. Um, I can stretch the different values. So here, if I don't know what a good uh, range to, to visualize is, I can say, stretch it to three sigma of, uh, or three standard deviations of the data that appear in my browser frame. Uh, so if I do that and apply, um, you can see that I get a much better visualization once the computation happens. Oh yeah, look at that. And I can further uh, explore, you know, these are all real data. I can explore and inspect uh, all the different values and uh, interactive, in, interact with the underlying data. Uh, similarly, it's easy to juggle the different band combinations. Uh, so earlier we had band four, band three, and band two, oops, band two. And this is stretched way too far. Um, <laughs> so I'll go back to zero to 3,000. And we um, get a nice- yeah, That's what we started with. Exactly. Um, so between the code and the UI uh, in Earth Engine, we can very easily interact with the uh, the, the different bands um, and see how their different combinations turn out on the map. Um, 
So can you, I noticed that when you clicked apply in the visualization parameters, the code didn't update. So it sounds like you can either change the code, change the band list in the code and click run or use the visualization parameters, little UI box and press apply. Um, either or both work. Um, but if you wanted to actually update it with, if you found the parameters you like in the UI and you wanted to update it, is, does, the, does the import button do that? Like how, do, how would you do that? Yeah. Um, so what import does is it actually creates an import entry um, here, helpfully named image viz param. And what this does is it's basically the same thing that we have in this visualization parameters block. So I, I scroll up to my imports and I see them at the top of my script. Um, and this visualization parameter that I provide to map add layer, I can just replace with image viz params. Image viz params here. Um, believe it or not, typing is my job. Uh, <laughs> And if I click run, we get exactly the same behavior. Um, Got it. This time, ignoring the visualization parameters. That because it's calling that new one that you just added. So exactly. you could, in theory, build uh, you know many different visualization parameters in the same code snippet um, and call them as you like. Absolutely, yeah. That's really cool. Um, awesome. And I just want to tell all the viewers out there that um, we're going to go over a couple more um, band combinations right now. Um, but uh, like I've placed all of these in the slide deck that's linked to the event website um, so that you can try them on your own. And, and, and Mike showed that website, which we'll also reference um, on the site. So you, you showed um, near infrared or you showed um, uh, true color or natural color. Um, tr can you try B5, 4 and 3, which is um, color infrared, N I R R and G, right? That's near infrared, red and green. And um, this is showing co uh, color infrared, which really pops a lot of vegetation. And <clears throat> I know from my studies at grad, in grad school, I relied on this heavily because <laughs> I was monitoring wetlands. And so, you know, you really want to understand um, wh which areas of the wetlands are um, more green, it kind of shows. And so the red really helps pop it up, pop it out from the image. Excellent. Since we were talking about Kiwis, I decided to swing over to New Zealand. Um, and yeah, th this imagery is beautiful. Uh, I will highlight that this is the surface reflectance data set. Uh, so we are sort of uh, getting for free the fact that there are minimal clouds and atmospheric disturbances in, in the data. Um, and so that's, that's part of why these look so, so nice and clean. Uh, the other part is that we're doing a median composite so that we're combining the pixels uh, before we visualize them. So uh, here on line 30, we have this, this median, um, which is really just combining the data. And then we do all of our uh, uh, visualization and combination. And can you show them, show the viewers um, the time span that this is currently combining? When you say combine, um, this is combining a whole time span of images, right? So yeah, okay, 2016. So I could um, say if I wanted to look at a fire burn scar that happened in 2020 or 2019, I could change those years and look and see, oh, sure enough, that's where the fire scar um, occurred and, and so on. Absolutely, yeah. Um... I'm going to go ahead and remove this map set center. I, I like our visualization that we have here. Um, or in particular, I like the place that we're looking at. So I'm going to remove or comment out this map set center call, uh, which will stop shifting the, the code editor to look at this particular point, which was off the coast of Australia. Um, I can show off another band combination here, uh, just flipping through some of the, again, like standard band combinations. Um, you talked about burn scars, Karen. Uh, this one in particular shows off uh, floods and burned land. Uh, so this is a, a visualization. I don't know if there's a name for it, um, but it does highlight those those physical effects. Awesome. And there's another one here um, that I that I was looking up. Um, B two, B six, B seven. So that Ooh. is what that's blue, and then the two short wave infrared or spheres, right? Um, um, and that really shows the, so two, six, and seven, yeah, and differentiates between snow, ice, and clouds. So that might be useful, especially if people are studying snowpack or, yeah, that's cool. Wow, sure enough, look at that. And I should um, just clarify really quickly, when we talk about the three different bands that we're using for visualization, um, really it's talking about which one we're putting 
uh, for the computer screen, which one goes to the set of red, the, the, the red channel, the blue channel, and the green channel. So your, your computer monitor, your phone show, uh, they have three different pixel colors, and they, they render all of the pixel uh, output as different combinations of those. So really, all we're doing here is slotting a particular wavelength to show in a particular uh, uh, channel of your, your screen. Um, so these are, are purely just for visualization, although we can do computation on these uh, using the rest of your attention API. Awesome. And that's a good segue to the next topic, was I would love to see how you do the NDVI in, uh, in Earth Engine. Yeah. So NDVI um, is, for those who don't know, it's a normalized difference uh, vegetation index. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Karen. That's it's right. It's <laughs> really a, a way of, uh, I think about it as determining like plantiness or vegetativeness of a, of a given pixel. Plantiness. I like that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> It's uh, it's a useful recipe. It's it's common in a lot of uh, pre-processing for scientific data sets uh, because it really gives you a, a useful and common index uh, for talking about how vegetative or planty a, a pixel is. Um, so it really highlights the uh, values that are higher, more more plant-like, um, show up with a higher NDVI value, and those which are less planty obviously show with a lower value. Uh, so things like rock or water will be less than uh, forest or grassland. In Earth Engine, uh, this is just expressed as a, as a simple ratio. Um, so there's a, a formula that you can use. Uh, we also have a normalized difference function, which lets you um, compute that automatically, uh, less automatically. And, and uh, there's less room for error here. So all you do is you specify the two bands that you would like to have as your normalized difference bands. Um, I can do that here. So what we're doing is we have data set, which is just a set of images. Um, I can express NDVI in, in two different ways. Um, one is to compute the NDVI for each of the images and then uh, composite that. So find a median value for each of the NDVI images. Um, that involves mapping a function over each of those images and then compositing the results. Or, and this stop me if this is less scientifically defensible, um, what we can do is we can just compute for the median uh, what the NDVI is. Uh, so I can take, for example, this data set, that median, and process it further. I'm going to get rid of this map set center. Um, and so now I have, uh, I've extracted this, this data set, that median call. And what I can do is create a separate NDVI image median dot normalized difference. And I provide the, the two band names that I care about. Uh, here, I think it's bands five and six. That's right. No, wait, yes, yes. No, five and four. Five and five is near infrared, and four is red. There you go. Perfect. Um, so there's bands five and bands four in normalized difference. And then all I have to do is add NDVI. And here, I want to visualize it with, uh, let's make another variable buffer, NDVI params. Uh, another visualization parameters object. So what this is, is I'm going to say the minimum value is 0, max value is 1, and that's it. And, and then I you need to reference those vis params. Is that right? Yeah. Perfect. So visualize my NDVI image with my NDVI visualization parameters. Oh, I have a bug. Yay. Normalized buggy. difference is not a function. Um, that's because it's called normalized difference. And the reason, uh, or the way I, I should have known that is when things are actual Earth Engine functions, they'll turn this beautiful shade of purple in, in the code editor. Um, so here you can see the difference between normalized difference and normalized difference. Oh, that's handy. So I'm running my computation, and lo and behold, here we go. Uh, what I can do is see, maybe with the satellite view in the background, um, hey, in fact, this does a pretty decent job of identifying wow. areas which are planty or plant-like. Um, it can also be helpful for us to visualize this with a palette. 
So I can go from, uh, let's say, brown to green. And I'm sorry, this is probably going to look a little gross. Oof, yes. Um, it's not bad. It's not bad. We can, I wouldn't, we can want, it. I wouldn't um, want to taste it. <laughs> we can play with the different uh, visualizations. And in particular, we can visualize it in the same way. Uh, or we can tweak this in the same way that we tweaked the, the raw imagery or the, the surface reflectance imagery by playing with the palette, playing with the different values, changing the opacity, et cetera. Uh, so this behaves a lot like the, the same way that we uh, can interact with the, the other more raw types of imagery. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. That makes it look very easy. It hopefully is. Um, we also have examples walking through this. Um, so if you, again, use your favorite search engine to find uh, the Earth Engine documentation, you can pull through uh, NDVI. This goes into all of the different ways to compute NDVI, the different pros and cons of each, each method. Um, this shows you techniques for doing uh, different types of indices. Uh, so there's normalized difference uh, water index, for example. Um, lots and lots of, of different applications of techniques like this. Um, so these examples come with code snippets, and they show you exactly how to how to do this with a particular collection. Um, here you can Yay, see. examples. I need code snippets. Love it. <laughs> yes. Um, this is actually a, a pretty, uh, like I said, a, a commonly used technique. Um, here in the examples, we talk about uh, building greenest pixel composites. So this is going through and uh, compositing the imagery based on the NDVI value. Uh, so you get a really nice looking composite, particularly for uh, data sets which, which have clouds in them, like the, the uh, top of atmosphere collection. Um, other applications of this include, uh, for example, uh, Landsat data were, were used for uh, the Hansen forest map, so the global map of, of uh, deforestation. Um, this is a large, large collection of uh, just a large amount of computation over those Landsat values, um, doing things exactly like we did here today, mapping uh, to create indices, and then doing further processing on, for example, um, finding distributions and standard deviations of those uh, and building classifiers on top of them. Uh, that technique was also used for, uh, I love throwing out this, this example, uh, the intertidal change favorite. data set, um, which did a lot of uh, computation in the normalized difference like water index, for example, or NDVI, um, built up large composites and then performed statistics and machine learning over those composites. Um, and comes out with great scientific results. That's awesome. Oh my gosh, thank you, Mike, so much for walking us through that and giving us these examples where, where everyone can follow up and, and read more, not just see the work, but also read the scientific paper that's associated with them and figure out more of what they did um, with Earth Engine and Landsat. Um, well, so while uh, you know, we were working here, I worked on some code that I'd like to show you. Um, and it's kind of like pulling my recipe out of the oven Right. It's kind of like, you know, the cooking shows. Um, and so here's my, my my finished product here. What I did was I, I wanted to look at different band combinations, but I wanted to look at easy more easily and I wanted to look at them together. So I basically created this Landsat um, 8 analyzer is what I called it. And each of these are a different band combination. This is natural color. This is color infrared. Um, and these are some interesting um, band combinations that I looked up online or that they're part of the, um, the code sample. I didn't build this from scratch. Um, you guys know me. I don't build code from scratch. <laughs> but I did um, find this great example here um, in, the ex in the scripts, example scripts down here. And it's called, um, what, what is it? Which one was it called? Linked Maps. If you click on Linked Maps, you'll get a Sentinel-2 analyzer, basically, looking at all the different ones. And so what I ended up doing was pulling in, pulling in the code that Mike just created and making sure the visualizations matched and whatnot. I also changed um, the filter date to be uh, at the end of last year um, because I was really interested to see how the fire scar looked in my region of the world um, following the big fires last year. Um, and so you can see here that I have um, some old parameters here that aren't being called, so I probably should remove that. But what I do have is from the code sample, I have four different parameters 
um, and the code just kind of places them in the four different corners. And so I'm able to change these, and this is exactly what I did change to suit my purposes. So now I can um, run this, I can change the dates or whatnot, I can run this and I can, I can investigate more. And what you can see is sure enough, um, this, the burn scar here, um, which is right around this area right here where my cursor is um, right here on the coast, that is a very obvious, it may not be obvious in this natural color, but it's very obvious in color infrared and even more so in this newly burned land um, band combination that really makes the, that the dry or the more warm um, area, whether it's vegetated or not, uh, uh, stand out. Um, so that's really cool. And then the last thing I wanted to show was that in the code samples, there's also this Landsat Explorer. Um, and so if I click on that and click run, this is already here for people just to use whenever they want. Um, and you can ch change the select filters. You can um, select an image uh, and even a different um, visualization that you might like um, and then export it. Now, this might not have everything you need, but again, now that you feel comfortable watching Mike, you can um, change some of the code up here and, and, and re and run it to um, change it to what you like. So uh, that's great. That's, I'm excited by what I learned today. Um, so yeah, I wanted to say thank you, Mike, for walking us through that, because even if you know a little bit about remote sensing, how to um, do it and apply it in an Earth Engine can be challenging. And, and even if you're an Earth Engine pro, sometimes you may not know exactly um, you know, what you want when you're looking at the imagery. You may want to look at the fire scars or you might want to look at the flooding or the, or the deforestation or the water. Um, and so it's very uh, interesting um, to look and be able to analyze and really interrogate the different bands. Um, to cut and slice and, you know, not make a big mess of the kiwi. <laughs> um, so thank you guys so much. Um, we put a lot of links and to good resources in the slide deck, and we've linked to it on the event page. Um, and we're here for questions. So if you want, you, if you're watching this right now live, um, please write your questions in the Q&A. I certainly have enjoyed myself on this culinary adventure. Um, thanks especially to you, Mike, for helping us um, 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 uh, uh, bring out those bold flavors. I now feel comfortable with Landsat in Earth Engine. I can I can really um, harness the power there. So thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. I'm uh, excited to cook a little further and and explore some different combinations of bands, especially with the the tool you built. Um, and we'll we'll look at the the resources that we have in the in the page for further information. Uh, I, I think it'll be tasty. Nice. Well, to everyone out there, thank you so much for joining us and bon appetit. Bon appetit.